Welcome to episode 172 of the Startup Show. Today I'm here at the studio and I'm welcoming Nielsen, who is the CEO and co-founder of Nomoco. We are talking about everything around how to digitally replicate the entire world and how we believe the future of AR and VR is going to look like, but also some very important tips and tricks and advice how to be as an entrepreneur to empower their employees and your co-founders. Make sure you stay tuned for the entire episode and enjoy. Welcome to episode 172 of The Startup Show and the second show that we record here in the brand new studio. And everybody who wants to come and visit, feel free to come and join us here. But today, I would like to talk to the CEO and co-founder of Nomoko, Nilsson. Welcome to the show. It's such a pleasure to welcome you here. Thank you for stopping by. As usual on The Startup Show, I would like to get a quick introduction. Actually, um, it's not so simple to find some background information about you. We did our research, <laughs> we tried. And maybe you can give some, some introduction uh, to all the uh, potential investors out there. Thanks for having me. Uh, You're welcome. Great location, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I'm Nilsson. I'm one of the co-founders of Nomoko. Uh, started a company four years ago here in Zurich. We're now around the block for a little bit. We, uh, I think, deliberately stayed to or tried to stay under the radar for the past, let's say, three and a half years, and only now starting to slowly uh, make the whole the whole public appearance as a company. Uh, invested heavy in in the whole research and development in the past mm-hmm. uh, in the past four years. So I think that was the main background, and and we wanted to keep it quiet for for that period of time. Yeah. Um, now that's a different story. I think we took a very European approach to first build some stuff and then <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> and then sell it. But uh, uh, that's a whole different uh, topic for a different episode. Yes. We think we can talk. Yeah, hours we'll talk about, about it at the end. <laughs> uh, about that uh, entire an entire episode. Um, originally from here, born and raised here in Zurich. I um, grew up with German parents. Um, did my studies in Maastricht in the Netherlands. Uh, lived in Germany before. Stopped my ETH study at some point because I've thought it was too theoretical and not applied enough. Enjoyed it a lot, but at one point I was like, no, this is this is going in the wrong direction. Yes. Um, and then found a very good program in Maastricht where I also got in touch with the whole entrepreneurial scene where we had um, basically an open curriculum. We could choose from 500 different courses. And I think that's something which I as an entrepreneur now value a lot because I have different backgrounds and different courses. And, mm-hmm. and I think that's something which uh, comes in very handy and, and also brought that international mindset mm-hmm. and, and uh, everything was in English. and. They had this um, problem-based learning, which was very nice. So you always had to solu- kind of find solutions to a given problem every week. Uh, and I think that's something as an entrepreneur that that just comes really in sure. very handy. So, um, I mean, you know, like I watched your TED Talk that just came out a few days ago. Yeah. Um, very, very impressive. Also, like from a speaking perspective, really, really um, Thank you. catchy. Um, and I mean, like, you know, like in this TED Talk, you brought down so many different types of like, New words that I have never heard of, um, which and is we like, try, even reduced it. <laughs> I mean, like from digital copy to mirror world to digital twins, so like very, very exciting. But I mean, again, like my, my audience or all the all the startup investors out there, maybe they have never heard of Nomoko before. Yeah. So maybe just give them a quick pitch, uh, like an elevator Thank pitch, you. just that so we all understand like what we're actually yeah. talking yeah. about. <laughs> uh, yes, of course. Um, and, and as you said, I think there's a lot of new words, uh, a lot of new new industries that we're tackling and. Uh, we're already trying to reduce the number of words we're actually using. So um, good that we didn't talk a year ago because we were using uh, many, many more even of, the, of, the, of those new terms. Yes. Part of the TED Talk or part of what we are doing as, as a company is um, we have this big hypothesis that the next or the fourth industrial revolution is coming. I think this is very much in line with the World Economic Forum. They have the, industri- the, the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Klaus Schwab, they, they wrote a book about what that, that next revolution is. And that next revolution in the end is the connection between the physical and the digital world. In other words, it means that computers, um, self-driving cars, augmented reality, Internet of Things are all kind of early messengers of that next fourth industrial revolution. And they are all about that machines in the digital world is directly interacting with the physical world we live in. And that's a massive shift because suddenly we don't have that bounded kind of box of, of, an, of an iPad or of, of, an, of, an, of a screen or of, an, of a phone that is presenting us the, the virtual world or the digital world, but suddenly the physical world that we live in becomes the same interface, right? Um, and that's not just for augmented reality, it's also for autonomous vehicles. Suddenly we drive both on the same road, right? Mm-hmm. There's an autonomous vehicle driving next to me um, at least for a certain period of time until we maybe get to the state where autonomous vehicles are the only 
allowed traffic in especially in, in crowded places like cities but um, at that very moment you have that that interaction in the physical world between the digital um, the, the normal world that fourth industrial revolution means we connect those two worlds um, and that needs an infrastructure and that infrastructure today we call it the mirror world we have similar concepts which mean at the bottom the very 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 same uh, thing we have from the iot world uh, the concept of a digital twin all of this means there is a digital repli representation or a di digital replica of the physical world um, that is available for machines. So it needs to be machine readable, it needs to be three-dimensional in many cases. It collects all the data there is about that physical world. And I think there is one big concept that is very natural to us humans, but there exists one reality in that sense, or one world, not one reality, that's a different topic. but. There exists kind of one world, right? one physical representation of things. In a digital world, you can replicate it as many times as you want. Uh, you have many, many different versions of it. So in that sense, you have to make the digital world more fitting or more unique or more kind of singular or more absolute in that very moment so that you have and talk about that same representation. And this is what we do as a company. So um, that's, that's a concept of the mirror world to, in the end, provide that infrastructure for the fourth industrial revolution. The mirror world is a 3D model augmented with all types of data, with IoT data, with pedestrian data, with traffic data, with energy consumption of houses, whatever you can find about the real world, made into one cohesive piece. And then we offer this um, as a platform such that anyone can add data to this mirror world and anyone can build applications which use that mirror world as an infrastructure mm -hmm. and then wrap everything into one, one cohesive piece. Very cool. I mean, like I watched, uh, as I said, the TED talk, and they're like, you, you probably use like from computer vision over, dr over drone, high image processing, everything that like there is kind of like in the tech yeah. buzz world. <laughs> yeah, it's horrible. Um, yes. <laughs> but like, can you explain to me quickly like the process of like how you really replicate, let's say, a city like Zurich? You claim that it takes you about two days using yeah. drones. Um, how is this process? How do I have to imagine this? Yeah, so, so I think there, there is, as you said, I think the beautiful part is that now the technologies are starting to get ready to actually make that fourth industrial revolution happen. So it's a convergence of, of a lot of those technologies. Like if you just have computer vision, it doesn't work. If you just have blockchain, it doesn't work. If you just have IoT, it doesn't work. So it's really a combination of all of this coming together at, the, at a good point in time or a good moment. Like for us, what, what, how, how we, or how that happens and, and why we have that many kind of technological pieces is, first you have to collect the data, right? Just the very, very first step. Unfortunately, the Today, crowdsourced data doesn't have the accuracy, the level of detail that you want, that you have an infrastructure that can be used for many different applications. And so some of the collection of data you have to do yourself. Um, in our case, it's mainly focused on the 3D models. Um, we roughly get uh, 50,000 times more detailed 3D models than, than other competitors in the space. Um, and that comes because we do the data collection ourselves. Um, that's done with drones, that's done with other means as well, but drones play an important role because compared to satellites or compared to airplanes, they fly much, much lower. So you're much closer to the objects, much closer to the city in that sense, which means you can record much more much more detail. The today technology of, from drones is slowly there that also from a legislative point of view, you have rules and regulations which pave the way of how actually you use those drones in, in cities. Europe, for instance, is a, is a very, very good place for that because they start to harmonize those rules um, over the entire mm -hmm. continent. Uh, in comparison to other other countries or other continents, so we're using drones for the data acquisition uh, with a little bit of of own tech in there, but I'm not going to go into this. And then the whole processing of the data starts. And there, yes, it's traditional kind of computer vision for the 3D reconstruction. This is something which has been there as a concept for the past 10, 15, 20 years even. And how can you basically, like us human beings, we have two different images from our eyes coming, right? So one is the left eye, one is the right eye. And from those disparity in the images, we can basically estimate depth. Um, so that, that general concept um, is, is used in, in photogrammetry since even before the age of digital cameras that was even used with, with film cameras, right? So we're using photogrammetry in order to make the first 3D model. Um, but then it doesn't stop there at mm -hmm. that point. You need to actually give meaning to the data. And that's where whole machine learning and everything comes in. You need to know this is a house, this is a traffic sign, this is a tree, this is the road. All of this information, the semantic information has to come in as well. And then it starts to get more and more complex, right? And at the very moment, at some point, you, you reach the point where you have so much detail in a 3D model that a mobile device cannot display this anymore. So you start need to start 
um, reducing the level of detail depending on the device that you're shipping to. So you introduce what, what is called in the industry level of detail. Mm -hmm. So how much kind of data do you actually ship for what application? So you have to simplify some of those models um, and, and all of it in the end, we took an approach that, that things are built very modular. So it's not that we have this one, we call it blob, so this one 3D model which everything is connected, but it's um, a little bit like Lego. So everything is its own piece, it's its own object, its own data point, everything has an own ID, an own URL in that sense. Um, so that's an important concept that in the end you can disassemble that world mm -hmm. at will, and you can reassemble it as it should be, or maybe also in a completely different in a completely different setting. Yeah, one of the things that like probably I see as, as one of the challenges is once you, you want to scale this and say like, okay, we want to really get like all of Europe, how long would this take you? But the more, more important, more interesting is like, how can you do this yeah. um, at scale? It's a twofold question, right? Or it's even a threefold question. First, yes, you want to have scale for certain applications. Um, it's a very local game in that sense. And, and it has that element that some applications are very global, like navigation, for instance. And then there's applications which are very local and very kind of defined to that specific location. Um, so sometimes you want scale and sometimes you don't need scale. Mm -hmm. um, so you have those two type of applications. An architect, they normally just need their building or the building that they're working on. So they don't care to have the entire city. They mm -hmm. just need that specific kind of region, right? Yes. And then if you want to have an autonomous vehicle, you ideally want to have a whole of Europe, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the, the element. The second element is that you need to answer the question from a market point of view as well as from a technological capability point of view and from a cost point of view. The market is now getting ready. So I think two years ago, the market would not have been at the point where it really makes sense to digitalize the entirety of Europe. It would have been a little bit that tad too early, right? Yes. So timing is really important in this. From an operations point of view, we are at the point where with, in the end, not that many humans, we can actually digitalize a lot of those cities. There's a big computational plane in there as well, of course, um, but that's... When you look at the, the greater kind of scale of things, that's the least of the of the problems today. I see a ton of applications that you can use. Like once you have yeah. this platform, once you have these details, maybe you can elaborate a little bit. Maybe maybe some of these more out of the box thinking applications that not everybody yeah. thinking. I mean, like obviously, like VR, totally like clear, straight like yes. gaming. <laughs> straight forward, yeah. But like I, I see, there's so many options for this. Maybe you can elaborate some of the things that yeah, like, maybe are not like kind of like obvious when you. When you, like when, you, when, you first, first time, yes. <laughs> yes, when you first look at this. I think uh, one of those, uh, I'm only a bit historically through this, this epiphany moments um, that also we had, because I think very early on we understood the value of, of generating digital replicas of cities very detailed. Uh, but then over time you start to run into these applications where you go like, oh yes, I never thought about this, this is amazing. Uh, one of the first ones was when we started to talk with autonomous vehicle industry. It's like, yeah, this would be really cool. And it was kind of the obvious use case was, yes, autonomous vehicles, they need to have these 3D maps, which in the industry are called HD maps, um, in order to navigate themselves. That's basically a TomTom, -tom in mm -hmm. that sense, or a navigation system for autonomous vehicles. That was the obvious case. But then at some point, we found out actually the first step is simulation. So the first step is actually that autonomous vehicles and other autonomous robots. So this is not limited to, to, to autonomous vehicles. This can be drones, this can be sidewalk, kind of pedestrian type of robots as well. For them, it makes no difference. If they train in a virtual world, which is very close to the real world, or if they train in the real world, it's actually the same thing because the sensors are anyways measuring the world that they live in in a digital format. So the interpretation of the signals anyways done by software. Mm -hmm. So now if the signal comes from a virtual world or from a sensor that translates the real world into a virtual world, it actually makes no difference. So that or very little difference. So at that very moment, you basically make it possible for those robots to have a virtual driving school in the case of an autonomous vehicle, which is completely um, digital and you can simulate much more of those kilometers that you need. Um, you can accelerate it a lot. You can run scenarios which you can never run in, in reality, so you can make it much harder. You can have kids run onto the street and test how an autonomous vehicle reacts to that. You can drive in snow in Zurich, although maybe there's only two days of snow really throughout the whole year. So suddenly you can you can run those scenarios through which are very rare to combine in, in reality. That's that's one of the, the things which now starts in the industry to become more... Yes more kind of known or more obvious, but that was like one of the first moments where it was like this this, this click moment was like, sure. oh, this is a really creative application. I think the other is, what is now picking up a lot, for instance, is city infrastructure for urban air taxis, right? So this is, apparently there's 250 companies out there which are, which are developing some 
urban air yes. transportation, right? It's sure. becoming this big thing. And, and we have been of our show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, it's about knowing the city. It's about being able to fly in that city, right? So mm -hmm. you want to first train in that city. But then you need to know where are the landing spots? Where are good rooftops? Where is maybe a good little green field where you can actually land those urban mobility taxis? Then there is the question of defining air highways. There is the question of, from a legislative point of view, is there maybe zones like kindergartens, like schools, like public places where you don't want to have any urban kind of or, or air mobility in that close range. So suddenly discourse with architects who plan new buildings needs to happen. It's like maybe you plan in a, an airport, right, on your building where, where those air mobility taxis can land. It's about defining safety zones. Where could you crash or land or safety land such an, an air vehicle? Where are good landing spots in general, even for a planned landing, not just for a crash landing? And all of those aspects, suddenly you need to really understand the city as a 3D as a 3D environment, as a digital environment. So this is picking up now a lot. And then of course you have the whole AR part and, and then you have the really crazy ones where it's more about using space to have workflows defined to even pay if you go into what we call like, if you go into a specific location then you trigger a payment because you're in that very spot, right? Um, so this would be for maybe tolling systems or for, for drones which deliver a package at that very moment, the transaction is done the moment they enter a specific location and then hand over that package. So this is then a bit more advanced things. Mm -hmm. um, one of the topics that I want to quickly uh, touch on is is the privacy. Yeah. Um, I think it's a fascinating story because again, like I think like now what we see what's happening with like the current like established social media channels where privacy is such a big issue and always the question still remains like are they able to make the shift into giving back to privacy? I don't know. Yeah. We'll see how, how it's going to happen. Um, but I think you have a very different approach to, to privacy. Yeah. Uh, so maybe we can elaborate on that. I think we, we, we messed up as a not messed up, but uh, <laughs> did a little bit of a wrong turn 30 years ago when the World Wide Web was invented, right? Where we didn't think about that those privacy rights or said, you know what, we're going to have it open because it's going to be this decentralized system and everyone is going to profit from it anyway. So the more we share data, the more open it is, the better for everyone. And that really led to the consolidation of this very data aggregators, right, which basically have a monopoly on data and, and, and users go like, well, this is my data, but someone else is owning it. This somehow feels strange. And we took a very different approach. We said, in the end, anyone who is contributing data, they should remain the owners of that data, right? And they should be able to control access, who has access to that data. They should control the business model of it, the pricing, everything around it. They should be able to say, you know what, this data I collected it. I don't want that anyone has access to it anymore because I don't, for whatever reason, they should be able to do that, right? And this is, I think, very much in line with the whole Web 3.0 yep. um, initiatives which are now coming that essentially if you take an image of yourself, you should be the owner of that image and you should be able to determine who has access to that. Is that access for free? Is that access in exchange for a virtual coin or, or for, for a virtual service. I mean, with Facebook, you could make the exercise that if you own all the images, you can give them free access, but then you can use their service for free as well as a network. But if you have them pay for your images, you would also have to pay for the, the Facebook service. So all of those ideas, I think, are now coming up and, and we're building basically that mirror world with those thoughts in mind, because I think that's the the future to go for, for data privacy. Mm -hmm. One of the things, I mean, like of the main um, obvious applications is AR, VR. Um, I don't want to go too much into it, but I am curious to hear about kind of like uh, when you expect this iPhone moment of AR, VR, kind of like, <sighs> do, you, do you feel this is something we sh still should be waiting for? Also kind of like from, a, from an investment thesis perspective, do you think there will be such a moment where like kind of like there will be a breakthrough where AR is so present in our life, or maybe you can call it like even mixed reality. Yeah. Uh, but in general, do you think like like we're just before this, or like no, we are, we are very far away? <laughs> I think this is insanely hard to tell, even for us. I think and we peak a lot. I mean, the, the big players are picking up a lot on that front. I think we we saw the first very good shift to go indoor and enterprise. I think Microsoft did everything right in the positioning of of Hololens. I think they. They are spot on from a business strategy where, where they are also technologically. I think they're doing an incredible job. Uh, the definition was there, indoor office environments, B2B, very clear, well-defined, right? Mm -hmm. And the next step everyone knows is going to be doing the same thing, but outdoors, city scale, collaborative, massive kind of online player 
uh, Pokemon Go type from a phenomena, but not Pokemon Go was a location-based game. That was not an AR game, right? Yeah. I mean, this is very important as a differentiation. It was just bringing the, the element of you need to be in a certain place to access certain certain information, but has nothing to do with AR. You can play it without any AR function. When the next moment will be like on a, the, the tech companies are ramping up on, on their front. I think this is uh, this is clear. Like the preparation is there for that next wave. I'm personally a believer that, that AR will replace this place. This is the, the new form of this place. When it will happen that glasses get good enough that you can really embed this into, I think this is what most people understand as AR, that you have these kind of sunglass, sleek type of, of glasses and, and you can mm -hmm. have an augmented version of the world around you. I think that's still, just from a physics and, and, and energy consumption point of view, a couple of years out there, we need 5G for this. I think every big player we talk to has that vision that the whole rendering is done on the cloud and then 5G is actually used in order to stream the, the overlay or just yeah. the display content to the device um, to save the computation. It's computationally very, very heavy. Um, so a lot of infrastructure still has to happen until it's really there on a, on a scale. But I think there was going to be a lot of moments of AR before that where just mobile devices will be used for this. And, and I think um, there's enough companies now experimenting with the first navigation apps as well. I think there's going to be many forms. And AR for me is not just visual. It's also companies are talking about audio AR, right? So it's really augmenting or using your position of you as a human being within the, mm -hmm. the physical world to, to augment that with digital information. And it's going to happen in, in bits and pieces. I don't think it will have this boom moment and then it's there. Yes. I think it will be a gradual build up and you will have multiple of those of those moments um, and a gradual build up. I mean, you saw it with Pokemon Go. This was this one spike and then it kind of slowed down again. So I don't think it will be the spike and then it will stay there. So it will be like these multiple moments of of epiphany. What do you think, let's say, are, are going to be the big players in this in this space? We have a bit of a different different time this 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 time around because all the big players they are aware of of that that shift to come. I think it's going to be a timing place. Everyone knows, or a lot of people are in the assumption that this will be the new display. So I think this is not something that is much debated. Uh, but it's a question of timings. So when is the time ready? I think that's the multi billion dollar question. And and some companies are going to run out of money before that, and some companies will be a bit too late, so others will, will catch that market. I mean, with smartphones, it was exactly the same thing. I think Apple, yes, they had a very good innovation on the, on the user interface and how they presented everything, but there were smartphones around before that. There were app stores. I mean, uh, Microsoft had an app store before there was an app store on the, on the iPhone. So the concepts were around, but then the iPhone hit and then everything took really off from a device point of view. So. When that is, I think it's extremely hard to predict who the players are going to be. I think there will be classical players in there, the big, the big gafas. Uh, some of them will also not be able to catch on, as Microsoft was not able to have the whole, or ride the whole mobile wave. That will happen. Mm -hmm. Some will miss out. Who that is is very hard to say. There will be probably a couple of startups which will also have their share in it. Quite convinced about that. And I think there is a couple of things where startups can position themselves very well in that space. But adoption, of course, that has to come. So this is one of the big topics, I think, for anyone. You mm -hmm. still have to wait for massive adoption on that front. So before we go into more like the ecosystem, uh, maybe just like a, two sentences about like the couple of uh, years ahead of you now at Namoko. Yeah. What is kind of like your road plan? Yeah, from us, I mean, there's, I think, two road plans. This one is building up actually the ecosystems around the, the mirror world applications and around the data collection, everything. Um, and on the other hand, to really build up um, the, the base of data that we have um, as part of the mirror world. So from our side to to acquire as many cities as possible in the next five years and really have a solid um, a solid baseline on that front um, mm -hmm. and really have the, the biggest two, three, four hundred cities covered because I think that's the baseline for an infrastructure to really have that big reach um, and at the same time really push that people start to use and, and start making, making apps themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, on top of it, we will produce some applications ourselves as well in order to inspire the community, in order to also monetize some of the, the trends that we see because we have quite a unique position that we we have the data in the first place. We we know where certain industries are standing, so we can exploit where we see there is no offering between the demand from certain industry needs and people supplying actually that industry need. Mm -hmm. So that's something which is very interesting to build own apps in, in that particular kind of where there's no offering. And on the other hand, we partner up with those which have an offering and where we see the demand and actually then make the match where we see there is clear demand, there's people in the space who have an offering. Maybe cannot scale because they don't have the data or because they don't have the ability yet as a, as a company to scale. So this is what is ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And in terms of funding? We're raising a 15 million round at the moment uh, with more international VCs as well in order to get that 
that next step actually going. And I think that's um, a big step coming out of Switzerland to make that kind of move. So yeah, anyone who's interested in talking <laughs> yeah, about this, I mean, you have to do some promotion on, on sure. that front. Uh, very happy to to join our conversation. Sure. Yes. When you look at the Swiss startup ecosystem, you briefly mentioned in, in during the introduction about like kind of like the European mentality. Yeah. How do you see kind of like um, Switzerland um, um, as a global player? Switzerland as, as an ecosystem, I think we have an extremely well positioning uh, in terms of technology, I think we have, funny that you mentioned AR, I mean, all the big players in AR are in Zurich. And they are here with an R&D office, with a tech office. So we have a very good tech component. We have the whole Crypto Valley as also more a marketing story next to the tech side and legislation side coming up. So I think we're well positioned on that front. I think what we're not well positioned is that global ambition and that global play. I think we're not well positioned to have both entrepreneurs and investors both being aligned on a global play, because that means that you need to pour in a lot of money early on and really go big from a thinking point of view. And I think this is something where we don't have that much alignment here in Switzerland and not that much ambition to really go global and get out of the comfort zone here in, in Switzerland. I think we have a very comfortable life. We have a very comfortable um, in, entire ecosystem here, right? And and making that step, I think, is not natural to us. It's not natural to to do an aggressive sales strategy. That's not something that is part yes. of the Swiss culture or even the European culture. It's not part of, of doing those moonshot type of things. That's also not, not necessarily part. And at the same time, a lot of the technical or the inventions are done here. I mean, the World Wide Web was, was invented in Geneva at the CERN. And despite it's being invented here, there is no big internet company which has some roots to Switzerland, right? which is insane in, in, in a way. You, you invent the core piece of it and then you don't are not able to capitalize it. And I think this is something which is a bit historic for Switzerland. I think that's something we have to change in the next, in the next 10 years, that the, the unicorns, I mean, we have a lot of unicorn potential here in the country. You just have to make it happen. We have to make it happen. Yeah. The first question would be, what inspired you for entrepreneurship? I think the, the possibility to really make a difference yourself to really change the future. Uh, I'm a very utopian type of person and, and I think shaping the future in a positive way, entrepreneurship is the best best way to do it. Now when you're looking for investors, what's most important to you when you kind of like approach them? Yeah, I, I think it's it's three parts. One is to have an alignment on the vision. And the second part is the, the belief that we as a company, of course, can make it happen. And the third, to really have a global ambition to really say, you know what, IPO is, is not a dream, it's actually a goal. What would you say um, is your the trait that you look for when you hire someone? I think this shifted over the time. Um, I think now it's a lot of also organizational skills. So the, the human skills, I think, are getting more important the larger you get um, and a bit more um, specialized skills. So more experience is, is getting uh, important now. What would you say um, is success in life for you? Oi, uh, I think to be happy. I think to, to, to have be really like in, in sync with yourself uh, and look, be able to look back when you're 100 and say like, you know what, I spent my time well. I think this is, this, this is <laughs> the ultimate happiness. goal. Um, and how would you say that you make sure you keep a work-life balance? <laughs> very, <laughs> well, very big topic for uh, another work. <laughs> to be honest, I think I'm, I'm, if you're an entrepreneur and you're not 100% living the topic that you're doing, I think it's very, very difficult to build a global company. Yeah. So I think for me, there is no difference between work and life. I think... Yes. This is my life. Mm -hmm. That's it. As an entrepreneur, you're always very unpatient. I think you always want to make, make things move fast. And I think that's very important. And at the same time, you, you need to balance the entire development of a company, right? From, from the fundraising, from the product, from the people, from everything around it. And that's, I think, the, the, the trickiest to scale really up a company. I think that's very, very tough. Uh, and the advice in that is empower the people that you that you have around you. I think this is a, a very important step, mm -hmm. is something that I think most entrepreneurs would agree with very early on, but then really how to make that happen, I think is very difficult that everyone around the table feels empowered. And I think yeah. this is something which, which will remain for any organization, in my opinion, um, a, a topic and invest a lot of time in this. Yeah, I think this would be the, the, the most important. Like, not just find a way to measure also this empowerment somehow and 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 get that going i think by now we have it figured out really extremely well at least at the moment and it always changes right because then you, the moment you have the feeling now i jinx it already right the moment 
we have the feeling we have figured it out. It's going to take two else. weeks and something, something else, else is going to be pop exactly. <laughs> it's going to pop up. But the earlier you can achieve that as an entrepreneur, I think the more you, your organization can grow. I see so many entrepreneurs, they are still like so much involved in, in certain operational topics, which don't let other people take that over. Right, I think that's the the biggest problem. It's the delegation part. Yeah, yeah, Probably, but it's right? it's it's not a delegation, right? It's easy to delegate. It's easy to say, you know what, do that. But it's very hard to say, you know what, you now own this, and you really decide what is the best strategy for this, and you really have to push it, and you have to basically inspire me as, as a person with your vision of that, and demand that, and that both parties feel empowered to actually do so and um, because then you really kind of have someone who is building up that part otherwise it's always a kind of um, a top-down type of approach it's like yeah please do this execute it that never makes the people really an owner and i think uh, novartis they have this this unbossed culture and there was yes. a big article in, in in bilance i think about it and 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 he's, the, the new ceo is talking a lot about it and i think that's at least in my opinion the new way of organization yes. forward uh, to really empower the people. But that's very hard because it has to come from both sides. You can empower as a founder, but the other side also has to feel empowered, right? And that balance is always uh, hard to achieve. And live up to it. And live up, <laughs> and, and live up to it. I mean, that's, that's the second sure, part. Yeah. There's not that many people which also are happy to live up to it. Yes. Uh, absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Great. Nielsen, thank you so much for being on the show today. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you for it. having me. Thank you so much, everybody who stayed all the way to the end of episode 172 yes. of The Startup Show. I really appreciate it. Uh, make sure you stay a few more seconds so you see who is up next week. I'll see you there. Have a great Monday and have a great week. Hi, everybody. Next Monday, we are going to talk about digital transformation of a grown-up big four firm, about entrepreneurship and about skill shift in a consulting company. Stay tuned and I'm looking forward to seeing you there.